Hey guys, how are you? How did the week treat you or is treating you? You know, for some of you this week, you may very well yell, yay! And for others, you may say, more, 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 give me more. That's because I'm trying something a little different this week and I'm keeping this video and podcast just a little bit shorter. In this podcast, we are discussing the three levels of landscape lighting. This way, you might be able to make a more informed decision on a landscape lighting project you might be considering. So, with that said, let's roll this out and get her done, shall we? Hey, I'm Matt. You can call me Coach. Every Friday, I bring with me landscape DIY education, concepts and theories, ideas and solutions, so you guys can go out and tackle a landscape project yourself get professional results, save a whole lot of money in the process, and in this day and age, be a lot more self-reliant. Man, after a 20 plus year career in the green industry, I'm bringing with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I wanna share with you guys, the new, modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner of today. So, exactly what are the three levels of landscape lighting? Well, it's the levels of voltage, basically, and how it's used. And with no, no further ado, let's just yank them out and throw them out here on the table. It's high voltage, low voltage, and solar. Very simple. So which one might be right for you? Well, in my humble experience, it depends on what your particular needs are when it comes to illumination of something. Let's look at each one in a kind of a pros and con type of approach and see what might be best for you guys. First of all, let's talk about high voltage lighting. It is often used, I would say, more in security and commercial applications, but can be placed in ways that can enhance strategic areas of your landscape as well, especially if they're larger areas. A couple of for instances might be uh, you have a large gated entryway or something that's at the end of a longer driveway for uh, obviously illumination, for security, for identification of address, etc. A lot of people use high voltage out there as far as uh, getting in and out of a dark rural setting and the gated entry is very much lit up. Another one might be house corners for like long distance illumination, long distance throw of light for security purposes. In accordance with the gated entry, you might also have long dark driveways, especially in rural or large estate-like properties in suburbia, where those driveways could really use some illumination for people who have never been up them before. Or, you know, because maybe you have inclement weather, you have family visiting, you have snow, ice, that kind of stuff to keep you on the roadway, that kind of thing. And there are the high voltage motion sensor style for security, yes, also used for uh, uh, repelling animal life like deer and, and other critters that are kind of light sensitive that'll scare them off most of the time, and mostly commercial applications. Commercial applications for landscape grounds, warehouse, exterior security, parking lots, etc. We're all very common with, we're all very knowledgeable on where that has been before. It's not really very common in the standard residential landscape lighting application where the goal is ambiance and not necessarily security. However, like I've done in other episodes, ambiance and security can kind of go hand in hand. It's just not the same amount of lumens that you're throwing out there. It's not going to be as bright. You know, the, the high voltage is going to light up the world and leave no doubt about it as where other kinds are a lot more subtle. For the most part, usually, unless you're skilled in this department, usually it's in, the high voltage stuff is not in the scope and skill set of the average homeowners. And they usually have to enlist uh, the help of electricians to complete the projects. You might be able to pull wire through conduit and place conduit to code depth and all the other stuff, but most likely the electrician is gonna come out and hook up your fixtures and run extra boxes and junction boxes and do the things that electricians do. So the other thing that you might have to do is you might have to pull permits depending on what some of the codes are in your area. So be aware of that. All right, our next one is obviously vol low voltage lighting. This often, 
I don't know. This often is the thought of as the gold standard of residential lighting because it's so versatile. It's safe. A DIYer can do it very easily. Uh, it is efficient too. It's efficient in its use of electricity. So it's not, it's kind of green minded, I guess. Nowadays, a hundred watt bulb can run, shoot, eight to 10 to 12 low voltage LED landscape light bulbs now. So, you know, it's, it's much more, much more versatile, much more diversified than it used to be. You know, fixtures, the fixtures are widely available and they satisfy most any taste and budget. It's safe to work with from the transformer to the cabling to uh, hooking up and mounting and placing of the fixtures. It's all very DIY friendly. It really is. It is, how should I say this? It is slightly less expensive than the high volt and slightly more than the solar version of which level you want to go with. But the longevity is there. The longevity of landscape LED bulbs, the fixtures themselves, the cabling when done correctly, these things will last for many, many, many years. Where sometimes the, the old incandescent bulbs, both high voltage and low voltage, yeah, I mean, their hours were somewhat limited. And generally, in outdoor applications, two years or less. And I've had LED bulbs in landscape fixtures shoot when we when we left weed patch ranch that thing still had the same bulbs going than it did when i put them in so five six years and they were still cranking not too bad huh so what is the downside then what could be the downside um i would say it's one for the i'm speaking strictly to the di wire it's the time of installation if you didn't do it from the very get-go and you're adding this element to your landscape then it's going to require a little more, uh, little more effort on your part. You're going to have to make way through some, maybe some existing beds and uh, tunneling under walkways and running cable and, and hooking up transformers and stuff. It, it's probably just the time effort of doing it, the physical labor that goes, goes along with it. I guess you could call it a downside, but I mean, tell me what landscape project doesn't have a little effort that goes along with it. You know, you just can't snap your fingers unless you go hire somebody, you know, plain and simple. Now, in comparison to solar, the cost, the cost can be up there a little bit, at least a little ways, you know, especially if you go big. If you have a big yard that you're trying to illuminate and decorate, uh, between the cost of fixtures, Lord knows copper wire, man, that stuff is really up there now. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you take a minute... You know, if you take a minute and watch the, the channel this week, we're actually going to do a couple of cutaways where I actually go to the store and walk you through some of the solar, low voltage, and cabling type of stuff right there on the shelf. So check it out if you get, if you get a chance. But the, the connectors and some of the miscellaneous tools, uh, a trenching shovel, obviously, you can get away with a standard shovel, but a trenching shovel tends to dig a little narrower, and it also tends to... Uh, little less strain on the back because you're you're moving a narrower shovel so you have that you've got wire strippers uh, you've got all weather connectors you know the dry lock type of connectors it all depends what effect you're trying to achieve but when it comes to the cost of the fixtures i've seen them nowadays i've seen them around forty dollars at the very cheapest end and i've seen those suckers this was back in like 2002 we're going back a few years now. And I had a particular job up in the foothills of Northern California where I was spending $400 per fixture. $400. That's what the people wanted. And they had like 14 of them. And that was just for path lights. <laughs> yeah, just for path lights. So the cost can be up there a little ways. But uh, hey, if you go over to the Amazon store, I've taken some of the more high quality type of fixtures and transformers and cabling and that kind of stuff. And if you'd like to help an old man out, hey, check them out. See what you think. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the solar lights. I don't know exactly how to politically say this, but I'm just going to say it. I am certainly have never, to anybody who's ever listened to me on this podcast or on the channel, whatever, I have never lied to anybody. And I'm not going to start now. I have only used solar landscape lighting in my own personal applications at my own home. I have never put them in 
in a professional application. I wouldn't do that to a customer. Now, with that preface in mind, it doesn't mean I'm slamming them. I'm just going on what I have seen. They do have their place. And I think for a introduction level into landscape lighting, I think they're okay. You know, I, I have found uh, their initial performance right out of the box. Once they get charged up, I have found them to be okay performers for the limited application that I used them for. And my application was deck railing lights and step lights coming down off the deck and a couple of uh, large rectangular ones that were motion censored for garage apron applications and for security lighting. That was it. As far as the, the multitude of path lights and up lights solar wise, I have, I have dealt with them so often. Now, they may have improved a tremendous amount over the past five years or so, but I found them to be uh, kind of short term. And the costs of some of them now reaching upwards of $49 per fixture. I sure hope they last long. I really do for the cost that they're asking for them now. But what I did find with the ones that I had is I, if you haven't listened to me long enough, I'm kind of a OCD guy when it comes to a lot of the things that I have. So I made sure that the solar panels were always cleaned, usually even waxed, but don't don't laugh at me. I know Maestro has, but I've waxed them up and I've done that on the low voltage fixtures as well because it makes them stay new, makes them stay and shed water. Uh, I did not have them exposed, these particular fixtures. I did not have them exposed to hard water spot, just rain water. So uh, they were okay when we left Wee Patch. They, they were still working. They were, they were okay. But uh, as far as longevity, I'd say if they were fully charged, they'd come on at dusk and I would say six hours, maybe six hours, and they were starting to dim. And those were brand new. And within two years, they were still working, but I would say that uh, that was cut by 50%. So they are an option for DIYers to kind of like experiment and learn uh, various applications of landscape lighting. You have to place them so that they provide the illumination that you want and yet are in a position to be charged throughout the day. And sometimes, like if you're doing up lighting for a fancy tree or a, some type of landscape focal point that you have, and yet it has to get underneath the element to be illuminated. And getting underneath probably cuts down a lot on the charging time. So it's kind of a push me, pull you type of thing. You can get it illuminated, but are you going to get it charged enough? And as far as the pathway lights, you have to set your expectations and know that the amount of light, the amount of lumens that these things throw off are far less than what low voltage is. Most of the time when I was doing pathway lights or up lights on trees and other things, water features, uh, I knew that I would get a bulb that would throw a certain amount of wattage on it so that it looked tasteful and it didn't look like the Las Vegas Strip in any way. So with the solar lights, you may only have, on some of them, you may only have like two watts, maybe a watt of light that comes off of that. And so it's almost, you know, some of them it's almost decorative rather than functional. But you be the judge if you go out and look at them. I recently spent some time with some friends and... They live in a place that gets a tremendous amount of sun. And I mean like 300 plus days a year. It's sunny. And they have a backyard that probably has, I'm guessing, 50 or more individual fixtures of solar lighting. They did not do low voltage. They just wanted to uh, kind of place and play, so to speak. And I took note of them when I first saw them. And then I took note again after they came on for the few days that we spent there. And I noticed that, uh, yeah, they were kind of dirty and the solar panels were kind of, kind of crusty, you know, and they would come on at dusk. And I would say two thirds of them were done by 
oh, I don't know, maybe within three hours. They were really starting to get dim. Dim to the point that the the function was not there anymore. You could see that there was a light, but it was so dim that it was kind of ineffective. But holy cow, quite a quite an investment. I would say, I don't know, if I was guessing just in fixtures, I would probably say $2,000, maybe $2,500. Well, there you go. The three levels of landscape lighting. It is a luxury element in the landscape, depending on how you want to use it. I used it for two reasons. I used it for ambiance. I also used it for security. And I did a great video and a podcast on just that, landscaping for security. And you might want to check that out. I hope I shed a little light on anything here that would be new for you. I hope you got something from it. I really do. And if you have any questions, you can feel feel free to shoot me an email or drop a comment on the YouTube channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Hey, if you get some time, go over to the Amazon store. I would appreciate it. The website is always there for the book and the course and for the 15-step DIY checklist. And we have a new checklist for maintenance over there that is free. I always want to give you something that you can take away where you didn't have to go into the wallet. So check it out. Hey guys, as always, to your landscape success, sure been a blast being with you this week. I will see you next week as always. So take care and enjoy spring as short as it may be. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show and we'll see you right here next week.